So thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. So I'm looking at the aggregate and distributional effects of a carbon tax. And economists widely agree that a carbon tax is one of the most efficient tools to reduce emissions. But, like, but ambitious carbon pricing reforms are relatively rare and that's partly due to the fact that people are concerned about its effect on economic output and on inequality. In, inequality. And so those fears, like, like a carbon tax is going to increase the price of energy and energy is the backbone of our economy and so the fear that it's going to lead to a recession, right? And that fear is also backed by past studies that looked at oil price shocks in the United States in the 70s and they found that the output costs of these oil price shocks were very large. On top of it, Recently, with the energy crisis, we saw that poor people might be particularly vulnerable to these energy price hikes because they spend a lot more on energy products. Okay. But a lot of this discussion is very kind of like partial equilibrium and static and ignores the wider or indirect effects of these carbon taxes. For example, it's not only the expenditure side of households, of households that's going to be affected, but also the income. Right, like depending on the sector that you're working in, depending on whether you receive more labor income or capital income, the carbon tax is going to have an effect on that. Yeah, and that's something that I would like to take into account. Okay, so what do I do in this paper? I'm going to develop a multi-sector energy model to evaluate the aggregate and distribution consequences of a $100 per ton carbon tax. And so that's a figure that's kind of like discussed at the federal level in the United States. And to give you kind of like a sense of the magnitude that corresponds, like the revenue of that tax corresponds to about 3% of GDP. Yeah, so it's, it's a big tax. So what do we know so far? So I'm not the first person looking at this. So there are quite a few studies that focus more on this expenditure channel and they confirm that yes, indeed, like the poor people spend a larger share of their, of their income on high energy goods, yeah? particularly like gasoline and natural gas. And there are also a few studies that look at this income channel and they say, yeah, this income channel can be beneficial for the poor if, for example, social transfers are indexed to inflation or if the tax revenue is rebated lump sum. Okay, but absent these mechanisms, this income channel is typically neutral and overall the tax is going to be regressive. But what these studies ignore is like this empirically observed low short run price elasticity of energy demand and the strong complementarity between energy and capital. Yeah? So when the price of energy goes up, we're going to reduce our energy consumption, but it's not one for one. It's much less than one for one. Yeah? Or this price elasticity of energy demand is relatively low, empirically around 0.2 in the short run. And I'm going to show in this paper that this has a big the fact that that's going to make the tax a lot more progressive, hurting the rich more than the poor. I'm also going to allow for households to work in different sectors. Yeah. Uh, it's something like an aspect or a type of heterogeneity that hasn't been looked at uh, in the literature. And finally, like the previous studies, they often used like a representative household model to make predictions um, of this carbon tax. I instead include heterogeneity among households and I allow for this potential feedback loop that household heterogeneity might also affect the aggregate dynamics. Okay, so what do I find? So this tax is quite effective, like carbon emissions are, are going to fall by 25% after five years, 50% in the long run, but that comes at a cost. So GDP is gonna drop by about 3% initially and 4% in the long run. Yeah, and so it's important to take into account that I don't take into account like the possible benefits of reducing climate change. Yeah? So that might actually boost GDP. Like absent this, GDP is gonna fall by 4% in the long run. And that fall in GDP comes along with a large drop in, in investment and actually like a transitory increase in consumption. If I look at the distribution effects, I see that there's substantial dispersion among households and the carbon tax is initially progressive, but then becomes a bit more regressive over time. And so this tax progressivity is driven by this energy capital complementarity that I introduced in my model. 
Yeah, so the first aspect is that capital income is going to fall. We're going to have something that's, that people call like stranded asset. Yeah, if you introduce a carbon tax uh, that makes it much more expensive to run your machines. Yeah, if you've got like, or yeah, like an automobile, yeah, if you have an SUV and suddenly the price of gasoline goes up, that makes your SUV, uh, the resale value of your SUV much lower, and you end up like, with all these stranded assets and like your capital stock loses value. Yeah? And so the capital owners who tend to be richer, they're gonna lose relative to the workers. We also see that it's actually the high produ um, it, it's, it's sectors that produce capital goods that are gonna suffer the most in the short run because of this fall in investment. Yeah, this, uh, um, like we're gonna move our production of capital goods towards energy efficient uh, capital goods, but like the traditional capital goods, that production goes down, and so people working in those sectors, they're gonna see a big fall in their, in their labor income. And uh, it's also gonna generate this limited pass through into, into consumer price, and it's kind of like what we know from Public Finance 101, like the, this carbon tax or this energy tax is basically a tax on the capital stock in the, in the short run, the capital stock is supplied inelastically, and so if you tax an input factor that's supplied inelastically, the tax incidence falls on that input factor instead of being, being passed through uh, to the consumer. Yeah, and so the expenditure channel is kind of muted. Okay, let me uh, go to the model, and I will focus mostly on like, how I introduce energy into a more standard DSG model. So we have uh, capital stocks in each sector, and each capital stock consists of a continuum of machines. And these machines are defined by two technical features. That's the energy requirement and the size of the machine. And if I do like a Cobb Douglas of these two features, I get the capital capacity of the machine. And this, this chi parameter indicates like the energy intensity of uh, 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 of that capital good and is specific to, to the sector. Okay, I can normalize the energy requirement to one, so, the, uh, so every, every machine uses one unit of energy, and so the bigger the machine, the more capital capacity it produces for one unit of energy. Yeah, and so the size of the machine is basically the energy efficiency of the machine. And so each period, the capital fund has to decide how many new machines to buy, the legs, and the energy efficiency of the new machines. And as the price of energy fluctuates, they're gonna either opt for very, like, very few but energy efficient machines if the price of energy is high, or if the price of energy is low, they're gonna buy a lot of uh, machines that are very energy intensive. Okay, and so even though you have like this whole range of different machines, the nice thing about this framework is that you can actually aggregate things up very nicely and you only end up with two state variables. Yeah, so the first state variable is the number of machines or the energy requirement of your capital stock, X, and the second one is the capital capacity. And you get like these, these laws of motions. And so the, the key message from this part of the model is that the energy requirement of the capital stock is predetermined. Yeah, so if the price of energy goes up, there's not much you can do in the short run. You can invest into more energy efficient machines and over time your capital stock is gonna become more efficient, but in the short run you're kind of like stuck with the capital stock that you have and that generates a strong complementarity between capital and energy in the short run and this low price elasticity of energy demand. And so that's kind of like the key, uh, key message of this, uh, of this block. Okay. Um, I introduced a bit of flexibility by allowing uh, capital funds of, of firms to, to utilize their machines at different rates. Yeah? So there's a utilization margin. Yeah? So if the price of energy goes up, they can kind of like shut down their machines if they want to. Yeah? And so energy consumption is then just U times X, the utilization margin times the number of machines, so like and each machine uses one unit of energy, and then capital services and U times K. And so that's also interesting here that this shows that if you want to save 10% of energy in the short run, you have to shut down your machines 10% of the time, and that reduces capital services by 10%. But capital services at one third of GDP, 
So that's going to have a huge impact on GDP. Okay? So even small savings in energy in the short run, they can have a relatively big effect on, on GDP. Yeah. So the carbon tax, as I said, is mostly going to be a tax on energy. <clears throat> and so if the energy tax goes up, firms are going to reduce the utilization rate. Uh, by how much, that kind of like depends on how costly it is to adjust the utilization, and I assume that depreciation depends on the utilization rate, and the stronger the link, the, uh, the more you, uh, the more you, uh, or the less you're gonna adjust, sorry, the less you're gonna adjust your, your utilization margin. And I, I calibrate that to make sure that I kind of like match this low but positive short run price elasticity of energy demand of like 0.2. Okay, so that's the core of the model. I'm now going to embed this into a multi-sector model where I have 400 sectors uh, based on the U.S. Uh, input-output tables. As I said, the carbon tax is a tax on energy, and for certain sectors also a tax on output, like cement. And here I've got a table where you can see the carbon intensity of the, of the different sectors. Here's the top eight. Cement manufacturing is the most polluting uh, industry in the United States. Uh, and electricity production accounts for about 40% of emissions, and uh, private use of motor vehicles, sector number seven, accounts for another 15%. Yeah, and so the carbon tax that I want to introduce that sectors have to pay is like proportional to these emissions. An important decision for the government is also to, uh, like they have to decide what to do with the tax revenue. Yeah, and so what I'm going to assume is that this tax revenue that they get from this, from this uh, CO2 tax is going to be rebated to the consumers via the consumption tax. Yeah? So they're going to lower the consumption tax. And so why do I do that? Because I want to look at the distribution consequences in terms of consumption, and this rebate via the consumption tax then is distributionally neutral. It's not going to drive my distribution uh, results. So briefly about the households. So I have a continuum of households. They hold uh, different jobs, which I later match into income percentiles. They supply labor inelastically. Wages are sticky so that a fall in demand leads to a fall in employment rather than a fall in wages. And households work in one out of J sectors. Yeah, so I don't allow workers to switch jobs directly, um, but there's always like a certain percentage of households that leave the workforce and some households that enter the workforce. And so those that enter the workforce, they will go into the jobs that have higher wages. And so over time, even though some sectors are more affected by the, um, by the carbon tax, these wages are going to rebalance over time. Okay. Households have non-homothetic preference. That means they have different consumption baskets depending on, on your income. And they differ in the labor productivity and the, the, the capital income share that they have. And so I'm going to use three micro data sets to, to discipline these three types of heterogeneity. From the current population survey, I can calculate for each income percentile in which sectors households work. From the uh, consumer expenditure survey, I know for each income percentile what are the goods that they, that they consume. And from the distribution of national accounts that are based on the tax data in the United States, I know for each income percentile how much of your income comes from labor and how much of your income comes from capital. Okay. Just as a side note, for those of you who are familiar with the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian uh, literature, the two Asian New Keynesian literature, um, like in the two Asian models, they often distinguish between workers and, and capital owners. Here, this distinction is not that black and white. It's more gray, like workers also have some capital income Capital owners also have some labor income, but you kind of get the same demand effects as in these tank and hang models. Okay, so what do I find? So the policy experiment is that I'm going to introduce an unexpected um, $100 per ton of carbon tax, which is, which is permanent. Okay? And so that's going to lead to an increase of the price of energy, like the, the blue line here is the transition. Uh, over the first 10 years, and the red dashed line is kind of like the long-run response. Uh, and so the price of energy goes up by about 30, 40 percent, 
that means that the firms are going to shut down their machines partially, you know, utilization rates fall by 6%, and that's going to drive down labor demand, and GDP is going to drop. Okay, but this drop in GDP is really driven by the utilization rate. So to get a better sense of this, this, uh, this fall in GDP, which seems relatively big, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do a first order approximation of, the, um, of my equilibrium conditions, and I get this expression here for GDP. Yeah, so the tilde here is just a percent deviation from the steady state. Yeah, so fluctuations in GDP are driven by fluctuations in energy and labor, and as I said before, the coefficient in front of energy is basically the capital share. It's one-third. Yeah? So the elasticity of GDP to energy is relatively large. It's one-third, and that largely exceeds the share of energy in GDP, which is like four or five percent. Yeah? That really kind of like shows you that energy is a particularly important input in our economy. But that's kind of like in a one-sector model. As macroeconomists, I know that the microelasticities are very different from the macroelasticities because if I have multiple sectors, I can also do substitution in cross sectors. In particular, I can uh, say, well, I'm not going to use cement, but instead of using cement, I can use wood. Yeah? And so that reduces this elasticity of one third to about 0.2 yeah? by shifting basically resources towards sectors that are less energy intensive. That's like the second term here. Yeah? And then in the long run, I'm going to have an additional term, which is the energy efficiency of the capital stock. So what's going to happen now in the long run is that firms are going to start to invest into energy efficient machines, yeah, and so the Z is going to go up. Yeah, that's the energy efficiency of the capital stock, and that decouples GDP from energy use. Yeah, so you can also see that here in this picture, uh, so energy falls by, in the long run, 50%, and uh, the, the energy efficiency of the stock of machines goes up by almost 40%. Yeah? And so even though energy consumption falls by 50%, GDP doesn't fall by 50% because we become much more efficient and only falls by, by, by 4%. Okay. Just briefly going back to the aggregate picture. So as we can see, investment falls. Uh, by more than 10%, and that's like the stranded asset e effect. You know, the value of capital becomes, uh, like really crashes. It's almost like a stock market crash that you get in this, in this model, and uh, you force kind of like firms to, to, to buy capital goods that are relatively expensive, like these energy efficient capital goods, and so that leads to this drop in investment. Consumption temporarily goes up, and that's like an intertemporal effect because the capital stock is still plentiful in the, in the short run, it's going to be low in the long run, so consumption from an intertemporal point of view, it's relatively cheap. Yeah? And so that's why consumption still goes up in the, in the short run. Okay, so that's the aggregate picture. Now let's look at the kind of like, um, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper, like, like what happens at the, at the household level. So here, you see the variation in consumption growth across households. Okay, so you see that like some households, for them consumption goes up by about 6%, and then the other sectors for which consumption falls by 6%. Yeah, so there's like a lot of dispersion across households. Yeah, um, but then over time, this dispersion becomes a little bit smaller. If I split up households by income percentile, I get the following graph. Yeah, on the left, I've got the low-income household, on the right, I've got the high-income households, and you can see that the carbon tax is progressive. Yeah? So we've got this downward sloping line. Yeah? So if you're in the top income percentile, consumption actually falls by 1.5% in the first year, and if you're kind of like in the bottom 25%, your consumption goes up by about 2%. At the bottom here, I'm trying to decompose this into the three different channels, like if you look at the red dots, you see that this expenditure channel is indeed regressive, but it's counterbalanced by these two income channels that are both very progressive. Then over time, if I look at the response over the first 25 years, I can see that there, like the, the tax becomes a little bit more regressive. You get like an inverse U shape. So all channels become more regressive. Okay, let's look at the different channels one by one, 
These are channels of the factor income channel. Yeah? So here I'm plotting you the response of labor income and net capital income, and you see that net capital income really, really plummets. And um, if I look at the distribution accounts, who earns capital income, not surprisingly, it's rich people, and so they're going to be affected the most by this drop in capital income. The labor income channel is a bit less uh, straightforward, but here, like, each blue circle is uh, one sector, and you can see the change in labor income in the first year for each sector. Yeah, so on the, on the x-axis, I've got the change in final demand that each sector faces. And so you can see the, the sectors here to the left, for them, labor income falls by almost like 10%, and those are sectors that see a big drop in final demand. So we know that this drop in final demand is most driven by the drop in investment, so the sectors here to the left, those are sectors that produce capital goods. And so since investment really drops, well, these are the sectors that are going to reduce labor payments, yeah? either fire people or reduce wages. If I look at the CPS to see, like, where do people work, then I can see that the high-income people, they tend to, uh, tend to be overrepresented in these jobs. Yeah? So the low-income people, they tend to work in restaurants, accommodation, retail, those are not capital goods sectors, and the high-income people, they tend to work more in manufacturing, engineering, and so they would suffer more from this drop in investment. Uh, the expenditure channel is a little bit muted. So here from the CX, I see that indeed the, um, the poor, they consume more energy-intensive goods. For them, it's as if the, uh, like the carbon tax is as if a v it's like a VAT increase of 7% compared to for rich people, for rich, it's more like 4.5%. But the pass-through of the tax into consumer prices, as I said, it's not one for one. It's like... 0.6 in the beginning, exactly for the reason that I said before, that capital is supplied inelastically, so the tax incidence falls on, on, on the capital owners instead of being passed forward to the, to the consumers, at least in the short run. Okay, uh, in the last two and a half minutes, let's me, let me look at a few model variations to show you kind of like the, the key features of the model. So here I show you the first year response of GDP, the first year response of consumption of the bottom half and the consumption of the top 5% and then the difference. Yeah? So in the baseline GDP drops by 3% in the beginning and you see that the tax is progressive yeah? given this last number which is negative. If you don't have any utilization in there, yeah? so firms cannot shut down any machines, then the drop in GDP is going to be much smaller because it's only driven by a fall in labor but the tax also becomes a lot more progressive. Yeah, it's going to hurt the, the rich even more because if you don't have any utilization margin, then capital supply is perfectly inelastic. Yeah, and you've got like this, yeah, exactly what I just said, like this perfectly inelastic, so they're going to uh, bear the cost of the, of, the, of the tax. If you assume, like instead of assuming like this Patty Clay feature, you assume a Cobb Douglas production function, which is commonly done in the, in the literature, you find a similar fall in GDP, but it's like here energy consumption falls immediately by about 20, 25%, and that's going to reduce labor demand. But more interestingly, you see that the tax becomes regressive. And that's why I had said before, right? that really echoes what's, uh, what has been found in the literature, like the expenditure channel is regressive and the income channel is, is is neutral in this case, so overall the tax, tax is regressive. And then I did an experiment where I did, looked at a lump sum rebate. Yeah, so the tax revenue is uh, everyone receives a check in the mail of the same amount, uh, so instead of reducing the, the consumption tax. And that's great news for the bottom 50% because it's check in the mail is relative to the income relatively large, so their consumption goes up by 14%, and the tax really becomes progressive. I was a little bit surprised initially why the GDP, why GDP falls even more, because there's literature, like I said, like this, this hang literature that emphasizes demand effects in response to these energy price uh, shocks, but 
Um, and you might think that if you redistribute money from the rich to the poor, that should stimulate demand. But the issue is that I'm looking at a permanent shock. Yeah? And the marginal propensity consumer of permanent income is one uh, across the income distribution. Yeah? And so if you redistribute money from the rich to the poor, that's not going to affect the aggregate marginal propensity consumer. It's not going to affect aggregate demand if you do this for uh, a permanent shock. And on top of that, the non homothetic preferences, um, the, the poor actually consume goods that are relatively capital intensive and not labor intensive. So if you redistribute from the rich to the poor, you reduce the demand for labor and that leads to a fall, an even stronger fall in GDP. Okay, to conclude, I show you like a quantitative multi-sector energy model to evaluate a carbon tax and I really emphasize this complementarity of capital and energy and I show you that that can amplify the effect of energy consumption on GDP and it can make the carbon tax more progressive in the short run. Thanks.